So in our first video in this series, I introduced you to the concept of keeping time on your machine, but not only on your machine, on servers, in enterprise solutions, and in data centers. Making sure that we have nanosecond resolution is really important, and that can be enabled through something like this, which is the new time card out of OCP. So for this video today, we've partnered with Facebook Tech Division, who have sent me one of these cards to have a look at. And I've spent this morning speaking with uh, Facebook senior engineer, Oleg Bloikov, who was involved in the creation of this. And we go through why it's open source, why Facebook needs some, something like this. And we also speak about how it can be used in gaming. <music> What's your minimum specification? In front of me is uh, the time card, part of the Open Compute Project Time Appliance Division, I think. And, uh, you know, working with uh, Facebook to get my hands on one of these, it's basically what we need to resolve uh, timescales in a data center down to the nanosecond. Uh, joining me is uh, Facebook engineer uh, Oleg Oblakayev. Did I pronounce that right? <laughs> That's fine. And uh, he's one of the guys kind of behind this, and it's all open source. If you want to go build one, uh, all the schematics are online, all the uh, components needed are online, but there's also going to be a few places that are going to sell these. And uh, as I understand, Facebook's going to start deploying these globally, if you haven't already. So basically, um, this device will allow to basically simplify and improve the timing as a service. You can think of it in the data center. Um, this will allow to turn almost any computer or server into the time appliance, which otherwise you need to purchase and maintain in a special manner. And when you have a time card, you can basically turn your existing infrastructure to support um, uh, timing at any scale, uh, practically, and with almost any requirement. Like it produces such precise uh, timing in single nanoseconds range that there is practically uh, almost zero other requirements to go lower. There, there, unless you're running your own GPS uh, satellites, your own constellation, you probably don't need to go to the higher <laughs> precision that this device can give you. So we, and this is not only about Facebook, actually, this is mostly about uh, setting the industry free. For example, we had a chat with different people, uh, including CERN, including the uh, different big, big tech clouds and everything. and. All of them are facing these issues one, one way or another. They all um, buy devices. They all struggle with devices. They all want to go to basically what they do best uh, is uh, giving sysadmins, DevOps, SREs, uh, whatever they call uh, the, the freedom of uh, maintaining this um, uh, infrastructure. And the card allows to do it. So that that's basically the main the main advantage of it, it unlocks uh, and helps to maintain and uh, uh, support the infrastructure. So as I understand it, most um, most data centers, if they want to currently resolve on that sort of time scale, um, it's very difficult. You have to sync up with GPS satellites, have your own internal NTP server, syncing up with every server in the data center. What you guys have done here is essentially enabled that GPS on a card by putting the vital part of the atomic clock directly into the computer. So um, this is this is a rubidium clock. And then you've got here an FPGA that does most of the control. And right. the uh, and the uh, global satellite receiver. I think uh, this one is synced up to GNSS, but you can obviously have uh, GLONASS and all the other different GPS as required. And uh, I love the fact that this is a PCI card. You'd think something like this would be, you know, require some sort of funky connector, 
relating into maybe the clock signal generator on the motherboard. But no, this is just straightforward PCIe. So if somebody wants to get one of these, if somebody wants to build one of these, how how difficult is it really? I mean, this project has been going on for what, a couple of years, design-wise? Somewhat around. So probably the most complicated part is the PCB, the board uh, itself which you see. Uh, so we published the schematics, so you can basically go to your local shop which produces the PCBs. Luckily, there are plenty of them now nowadays. And order the PCB to be printed for you. Like, uh, they're not terribly complicated, so uh, almost any workshop can, can make it. And then you will get uh, all of them uh, be ready to, uh, act, to take the active components like the GNSS receiver, the clock, and the FPGA. So at this moment, it takes approximately 30 minutes for a scaled uh, engineer to put all the components on the card itself. So uh, yeah, basically that, that's how much effort, if you know what you're doing, more or less, <laughs> it takes to build one. Uh, but of course, yeah, you still need the PCB. Um, and you've got this, uh, the, the, the atomic clock, this rubidium clock, about $1,000, I think I saw online, just one of these. But obviously, if you're building at scale, it's kind of rolled into the cost of having a card in every machine. Is a card in every machine, you know, reasonable or do you just, or do you spread it out per rack or? So yeah, there are very many good protocols to actually ensure very good synchronization. Like you can think of, let's say, PTP or Synky, which are now dominating the high frequency trading industries. Basically by having one card per data center will ensure all hosts in the data center are synchronized uh, with nanosecond precision. So you, you don't really need many of those. Uh, however, we even thought about this one. If, for example, you say atomic clock is not something you strictly need, like you can tolerate the drift more than one microsecond a day if GNSS is lost, uh, then you can use uh, different kinds of oscillators. So there is TCXO, OCXO, and different types of oscillators, which can cost from $50, and uh, they will not give you one microsecond a day precision or even some nanoseconds when, when the drift is happening. But that might be okay for your particular use case. I mean, it's fairly easy to understand why, say, a bank or a stock exchange needs you know nanosecond latency. We're talking literally clock cycles of the CPU because you need to understand exactly when transactions occur. Facebook, we kind of understand. Okay, you need to know if somebody posts you know an image or a video at a certain time, and that's reflected in people's feeds. So to what extent does Facebook need nanosecond precision? Uh, isn't that sort of a bit lossy on that front? So the very typical use case for such precision would be uh, databases. When you are struggling to order events in the databases, let's say you have some sort of a replication and uh, events are coming to multiple nodes at the same time. Uh, how would you know which one came first, which came later? Uh, usually it's just by the timestamping the events. But machines are getting so powerful and the database software is getting so advanced that you can actually tolerate really, really high volume of those queries coming at the same time across multiple nodes of your distributed database. So when they all try to merge them together, you may end up with uh, one transaction being in front of another transaction, but only because the time difference on the hosts was greater than actually the ordering of the transactions. So you may end up mixing them. And that's a very good use case uh, for, the, uh, for the precise time application. There are very more <laughs> use <laughs> cases. Uh, you can, for example, completely eliminate centralized nodes, uh, which uh, let's say, sort out which transaction came first, which kind of transaction came second. You can completely eliminate all of them if you're confident that time in your data center is not just precise, but it's actually correct. So you can say, okay, I know for sure hosts are synchronized within one microsecond. 
all of them. I know 100% sure. I'm 100% sure of it. Then you can say, okay, I received the transaction. I will sleep one microsecond or what is the worst window of uncertainty in this case. And then after that, you are, make, you are absolutely sure that the next read from the database you do will definitely contain this information because the worst scenario basically passed. So, I mean, before these cards, sure, sure, surely, you know, companies like Facebook would be already dealing with that sort of millisecond, hundreds of microseconds difference. And then convey using one of these, you're literally going down to nanoseconds across data centers globally. Ultimately, does that make these uh, transactional databases easier to manage? Or, you know, how, how, how does... How how do I, as an end user, experience the benefit of Facebook having this greater degree of synchronization through one of these cards? For 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 the database example I gave, the engineers who are working as like customers of the databases, they will experience uh, they will experience significantly less effort to work with the database. They will work with the database as something. Um, singular you will always work with like like it's one large computer it's just underneath it it will be distributed uh, across multiple nodes but you will always work and you will not just work like you have an interface to work with one you will always assume that there are no delays you will always assume the transaction is successful you are uh, you're assuming there are no race conditions and many many things coming with the time improvements of course, you need to do the changes on the database side to make sure you support all of that and uh, you are actually trusting time. Uh, but uh, as soon as it's done on the database side, uh, en engineers who are working with it will benefit greatly by, simpl by simplification of the uh, communication with the databases. I can give you a simple example of uh, how users can benefit from such devices let's say in the smaller scale uh, or at, even at home uh, if you have like a rack or uh, if you have your own uh, internet of things so very often you will basically end up using some public ntp service like timefacebook.com is a good example is a public ntp service and as much as we love it and as much as uh, it's working reliably you're adding yourself a dependency on the internet connectivity. So you have to make sure your firewall allows the connecting to the public NTP service. And you also have to understand the risks when internet connection is going down or public service is having some difficulties, giving you wrong time or just being down. Then uh, you need to understand the risk that you also will have difficulties and experience maybe outage. And that's not just, you know, you will experience a uh, slightly different time because normally computers are drifting very much. The oscillators in your servers even are very bad. You will experience seconds uh, of difference because they all drift different directions. You will experience seconds difference between computers very, very fast. And this leads to disasters like when you when you schedule a job campaign or whatever to start at exactly midnight or whatever, then one machine will start, another one will not. And it's very often causing crashes. Very often your software will just simply seg fault or uh, <laughs> even data corruption is possible. So uh, it's always best to have the source, such important source like time localized new environment even if it's uh, just a small data center, or even if it's uh, your home rack, it's much easier to have this uh, time as a service at home. It's well, when I was doing my research for this, I think it was really interesting how the modern data center will ping your, you know, the GPS satellites to get um, an indication of time, but then that's not always possible due to weather, as you say, or due to internet conditions and such. So by having this internal Essentially, the atomic clock internal means that you can ride the wave until you can get connectivity back again, and then it allows that sort of synchronization at scale. I, I think pointing out the the you know the home user you know cron jobs is can can be important when you don't have that service. I mean, 
modern internet infrastructure isn't always the best, especially for home users trying to get, um, especially say, I guess on a certain level you have um, your, you know, your home IoT, your uh, electronic fire sensors, fire alarms, that sort of thing. If you don't have connectivity and synchronization to that, you don't know if there's an error maybe or when it happened or what have you, or even security alarms. No, you make a really good point. So g going through the board itself, I mean, uh, so on the card, we have its own GPS receiver up here, this uh, GNS receiver. I assume that's just to make sure that it that the internal atomic clock is synced globally between systems, between data centers. You're actually asking a very good question. So technically, if you look at the card as just one card, uh, the obviously GNSS receiver needs to uh, have some notion of time. So to receive from satellites, uh, because modern GPS or GLONASS or Baidu constellations, which are all, by the way, supported by this receiver, mm -hmm. they are all not just providing location, they're also providing a very precise time. In fact, up to 12 nanoseconds uh, accuracy. Oh. So... Uh, we receive the time with the GIS, this receiver, but there are several problems which uh, can happen just because of this um, uh, uh, wireless technology, you can say. So first of all, you have to have a blue sky, right? So it's like clear sky. You have to, if, if there is cloud or shadow or anything like that, you're uh, like a plane passing by, you can have some sort of disruptions. But my favorite example is when some important people uh, passing by, they often jam GPS. And this ah. is actually a well-known well situation when uh, GPS stops working in the radius of 40 kilometers around some event. Mm -hmm. And uh, like by mistake or on purpose, uh, you may have your GPS jammed and then it may lead to outages. So the atomic clock is sitting there and basically ensuring you have this important backup uh in case uh, uh this happens the atomic clock itself drifts approximately one microsecond a day and depending on the quality of the atomic clock and the oscillator in general and there is a fpga which basically merges those two together and it basically we call it uh between ourselves obviously some sort of a time engine and this basically gives multiple inputs from the atomic clock and from gps it understands if there is actual active jamming, if there is a spoofing because of the uh, someone tries to feed you wrong date, which was not <laughs> previously seen, for example, yeah. things like that. So there is a lot of magic happening in the FPG itself. And another thing is actually GPS or, or any other actually constellations, they are fairly unstable. So uh, because of so many movements, the Earth rotates, the yeah, the the. Uh, the, the waves are traveling at different speed depending on different conditions. You have actually like 12 nanoseconds stability, but it's always jumping. Uh, and uh, you may have basically, you have troubles to understand what should you trust. So you need to kind of um, rely and smooth it out. Uh, and atomic clock and the time engine help a lot here. So what was the decision that led you to open source this project? What was the driver on that front? Why not just keep it internal? That's an excellent question. So uh, open source was basically the day one goal because uh, before we actually started with this project, we were, as other people uh, still in the industry, working with the uh, boxes, uh, you call them, which you have no um, control over. And it gives you very many headaches, in fact, too many if you think of it, about it. So when you have many data centers and you have very many boxes, you need to manage them somehow. You need to uh, schedule updates. Uh, you need to reboot them safely. You need to do many, many things. And those boxes are often not designed for that. They're designed to stay in the in the works uh, in case of nuclear war and give time <laughs> to some, some some people hiding in a bunker. And uh, it's unfortunately, uh, it's not exactly what modern infrastructure is expecting from them. Uh, and 
another important uh, thing is the security obviously there those boxes are those boxes are closed source very often so they run some software which is written by some companies probably 20 years ago and of course there are vulnerabilities and of course uh, more and more of them popping up and the the, uh, the further we are in the 21st century then uh, greater impact if somebody hacks uh, through them so we, mo we that was our main goal to make sure those things are easily updatable those things are as secure as possible by running modern operating systems by running drivers by running open source software on them and uh, the only way to achieve this is basically having it open sourced that people see it transparently that people trust it and if people want to or spot the problem, they can submit a fix, basically, much like you did with your regular code uh, review on GitHub, let's say. So, I mean, given the fact that it is an FPGA means that there were, is expecting to be updates as requirements needed, but also individuals can implement their own custom, say, cryptography algorithms if needed uh, on board to manage with uh, the atomic clock. So FPGA, of course, uh, so you, you can flush uh, the new firmware version through your Linux box, let's say. Yep. But even more important than FPGA, of course, that, that that's important, but there is a very limited vector of attack on FPGA. Uh, what, what is even more important if, let's say, you are running your Linux box where you run NTP server, and this NTP server uses the time card, then the NTP server gets outdated, which means through the NTP protocol, you can hack into the box or you can destroy the box or you can use it for DDoS or you can, <laughs> there are so many vectors of attack. I can't even name them right now. So uh, the important thing is that if your NTP software gets outdated or there is a security vulnerability in it, you can just by one command update your Linux box, which is like any modern engineer can do, uh, that, that, that's, that eliminates security or fixes security whole right away. And this is impossible to do or near impossible to do with the, uh, with the boxes. So what, what's the time scale for some of the like uh, time card moving forward? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of been out for a while. Now you guys are making a more sort of formal announcement that it's here and it's ready. What have you got planned further down the pipe, either for this or for something similar? We obviously like it ourselves. That's why we uh, invented <laughs> it and uh, tried to promote it, of course. So our dream, so we're actually hosting the OCP forum uh, and anyone can join and listen to the presentations. We're actually ho uh, hosting people from all the industry you can think of. There was Google recently, there is CERN, uh, there was Intel. So there are all companies you can name are all in the, uh, in the OCP forum one way or another. And uh, we want to, the, for the industry to be truly changed. Like we want uh, it to be free uh, from the vendor lock. We want people to uh, get it more accessible because remember the box itself is it, not like I call it a box, but it's not, uh, it's not cheap. It's uh, <laughs> not every company can actually afford such box. Yeah. And much less if you are a researcher somewhere, somewhere in, the, in Siberia, in Russia, uh, it will be hard for you to get such box. So what we really wanted is to give freedom for people to build the box themselves uh, and continue with the research. There is so much uh, potential for this. Uh, for example, when we spoke with CERN people, uh, they, with the CERN engineers, uh, they were actually uh, clearly stating that the precise timing is what they use to detect particles. Yeah. So there is unlimited potential uh, and we wanted more people to understand and realize it as soon as possible and uh, get at least get give it a try. <laughs> it's yeah, no, I, I can imagine Sir needing picosecond level solution for some of their detection. <laughs> so Definitely. yeah, and um, so, but the, the, these will also be made retail. Um, do you happen to have a list of where who? Is going to sell initially. I think I'm going to put some in the in the comments below lists. Yes. So we're working with external partners who 
uh, under the OCP uh, umbrella. So we published a spec, uh, not exactly how to do it, but what is the expectation from the cards. So it yep. should have some number of outputs. It should produce some sort of interfaces, etc., and precision and holdover and uh, uh, accuracy. So all of those things are enumerated there. And any vendor actually who can build such things, especially at scale, can jump in and start working with OCP to build those and produce and sell them. Uh, we have already one vendor who is uh, actively involved and they actually already published an open, open sourced even their implementation. Uh, its name is Aurolia. So you can uh, look them up. Uh, they they I'm not sure if they made a public announcement, so uh, <laughs> or at least uh, we. I think they have. Place. Yeah. So in any case, uh, our earlier guys are already involved, and there are more vendors. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not ready to disclose it right now, but uh, they they will be building such cards and sell them on the open market. Uh, so we are really hoping that this will have a positive impact on the industry. So uh, coming to Amazon near you sometime, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah or, or, or facebook facebook marketplace <laughs> that would be fantastic that would be, That'd fantastic. be fun That's a shame. let me add you one more example and uh, unfortunately i forgot to mention it uh before Go for it. So, uh 5g is a good example whenever you're using the 5g technology whenever you accept expecting a fast internet connectivity there uh it's all relying on precise timing uh, there is no way around it so if uh, in the future people want to have um, technologies like 5G, internet connectivity, database throughput and everything, everything like that progressing, you have to go down, like you have to go to gigahertz in the CPU, you yeah. have to practically go down to nanoseconds in the synchronization across the, uh, across the, the globe, basically. So you basically have an uh, entire world working as a, a one big machine Sorry. <laughs> it started so, so good and now my dog came <laughs> that that's fairly interesting given that with 5g the goal is to have millions of users going through the same access points with you know gigabits per second download rate and you need a system to manage all those packets in a very timely manner. With the, with this sort of card, do you end up sort of polling it every time you need a timestamp? Or is it a case of it just broadcasts the time that it can be pulled? Because I can imagine there's there may be a rate limit or somehow on this. So that's actually a very good question. So when you plug the card into the Linux PC, or we're actually working on different drivers, like for FreeBSD, for Plan 9, for Windows, this is all going to happen at some point. So whenever you plug the card into a Linux box, let's say, it exposes so-called uh, PTP hardware clock, PHC. And this one gives you time. Like uh, you can just say, what time is it now? And it gives you time. So how you distribute it, it's a separate story. Like usually if you, for example, use NTP, uh, a simple example would be Crony, which is a very popular NTP daemon. So very many people or very many computers and the data center servers will query crony via NTP protocol and crony in the turn will query time cards to give the time to people basically. Yeah. And uh, this is a very, very trivial operation to get uh, time from the, um, uh, from the card. So it's called IOCTL. So you basically via IOCTL interface, you say, give me time. It's a really, really tiny block. And it's a, like on, in the core of the, of the um, driver communicating with the external devices. And this being PCI is extremely performant. There are gigabits per second throughput. So you can have, you can handle many, many, many of those calls. Basically the bottleneck we see, uh, which happens right way before then um, actually the time card is giving up or the subsystem which is managing the driver is giving up is basically your CPU runs out because <laughs> right. the Chromium will try to send so many packets per second to the end users 
or PTP for L for PTP or any other service you prefer, uh, it will end up sending so many packets per second that your computer will rather die than the time card um, <laughs> <laughs> will run out of its capabilities to give you a precise time. Oh, that's funny being CPU limited. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, uh, for such a small operation, right? I mean, yeah, I, it's, uh, I can imagine, you know, 100,000 people in a stadium all connecting through 5G, trying to transmit video, and then everything needs to be synced up with your timestamps. And then if you keep polling, you're, you're, you're also going to have more than one system <laughs> trying to deal with that. But uh, I just wanted to point out, we, we, made, we made some synthetic tests uh, to make sure it's working correctly with a large number of users. So we generated a lot of traffic. So at the point of where we are now, we are easily serving 100,000 clients from one uh, card like that. So, and there is no limit in sight. So <laughs> uh, as, as you can think of, uh, we, we run into other bottlenecks. Like you, you literally yeah. have to optimize the kernel on your uh, system to send so, uh, so many packets so fast. Sometimes when we speak about um, operations needing timestamps, needing everything to be in a certain sequential way. We deal with real-time CPUs and real-time operating systems because then everything has a guaranteed order. When you have a real-time operating system, it means whenever you basically schedule a process, it's as, as executed right away. Unlike, uh, let's say, Linux, which can postpone the execution because of some resource management. However, it's, uh, when you're talking about large cluster, which is distributed over the network, like uh, you have 10 servers, let's say, in the rack. And in this rack, uh, they're all real time. But nevertheless, the packets and the request to do the thing will come to those machines in a different uh, order just because of the cable length, because of the different... Uh, and I'm not, I'm not joking. Uh, we actually measured... So, and it's a publicly known fact that the optical fiber is transmitting the, uh, let me remember the numbers. Uh, so optical fiber transmitting the signal, like the speed of light is very limited, especially in the optical fiber. So we established that you have approximately 500 nanoseconds error per 100 meter of the optic, optical fiber, which means if in one rack, it's harder to imagine, but across the different uh, building and even the same region of two or multiple racks, you can easily have 100 meters difference. And then you have half of microsecond, which is for human is absolutely nothing. But for order in the transactions of the database, this is plenty of transactions, which can be at least uh, started. Uh, yeah. So. It, it, it is it is important even unfortunately on the real-time operating systems they will not solve that problem so the time card originates as a source so you can have yeah. a very precise and very stable source of time when you are distributing it let's say you're using sync e or uh, ptp with hardware timestamps you have your all nodes across the data center synchronized with single nanoseconds numbers digits you get the uh, if you go down with Sinky, you can go even to picoseconds on all of your servers across the data center. So it acts, and if it's not stable, if let's say the source is jumping all the time, half second there, half second here, uh, the servers, no matter how good the protocol, which synchronizes all of them, you will have some discrepancies. You, you will jump yeah. randomly. One server will go slower, one server will go faster. So you will never get precise time if it's unstable. So what card, this card gives you is it gives you very precise time, but probably even more important, it gives you very, very high stability. So, so your error can be constant, but your jitter is minimal. Yeah. In fact, when, when you're using, let's say, Sinky, you don't even often care about exact time. You you may think of like you may choose random time. You can choose your own birthday in the data center infrastructure and say this is when the time count starts. What you are really distributing is a very very precise counter and synchronize all the hosts to this counter to make sure they all operate as one big um, machine. It's uh, it's uh, like when when you end up smearing the leap second over the day. As long as everything's in the right order. 
is fine. And this can help also control that as well. There are very many horror stories uh, how people try to smear lip seconds, not on centralized nodes or limited set of machines, but they try to smear the lip second everywhere at once. And uh, because there are different oscillators, just because even if CPUs are identical, there are differences on how they made the number of broken transistors and whatnot. So you may end up with different time in microseconds, but it will be completely different between boxes uh, just because you are smearing on them. And that's actually a big problem. Uh, and it's getting bigger the more precise time you need. So actually, if you're talking about very precise time, like PTP or Sinky, you, you're, not, you're usually not dealing with the leap second. That's uh, usually a very bad choice to, 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 to take. Uh, the leap second is for human. The UTC is for human, for you, for me to understand what time is it now. Computers usually don't care that much. They mostly care about uh, being uh, very close to each other. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I hope that answers something about this card. Uh, it has. Oh, no, for sure. I, I hope. I hope we try to uh, we try to spell it out and we try so people hear us uh, that this card, the applications are limitless. Uh, hmm. You can think of AR uh, when you need to register uh, events from different controllers at the same time. So you don't have a lag, which makes you, let's say, uh, sick uh, when you're playing, right? Uh, you can think of the autonomous cars, which need to detect events and uh, synchronize them between multiple sensors and uh, um, uh, cameras. So all of those things, the more advanced we get, uh, the more precise timing they need. And it's definitely time to change the industry, which was, uh, I think not changed since last 20, 25 years. So, so you're saying that if I set up a LAN party and was able to synchronize every machine, that we could play a first person shooter and regardless of the lag, the server would actually compute everything in that game in the order it's supposed to be based on actual real time and not vague jitter based on, you know, uh, network latency. Oh, definitely. A uh, good example. <laughs> Perfect. De definitely. Good example would be like, uh, ex again, uh, shooting at each other, throwing something at each other. It all uh, comes down to the transaction, who made transaction first. Yep. And the easier you can solve this problem, uh, the better quality and uh, the better experience you will get. It's uh, so, so, so all, all you need now is a shroud with some RGB LEDs. And then, and then find Unreal Engine to be able to implement synchronization driver into this. And, and exactly. that's it. If you, if you want to ensure that your actions are done in the right order, then you, you need this thousand dollar upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, it's cheap, cheaper than GPUs these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it might be one of the applications. We don't even, uh, know all of them. We just try to provide the source. We try to provide the tool for people that they can use to uh, do many good things. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I, I think that's, a, that, that, that's an interesting angle that I should definitely play on the gaming angle. <laughs> yeah. Now, what, what, what the gaming angle I, I had in mind already is, again, the VR, when you have, especially VRs, which are coming um, they are, they are becoming wireless. They are becoming more and more advanced. The, the graphic is getting better. The complexity of the games is getting uh, increasing. So you often end up like moving your hands in a very fast pace, turning your head, uh, squatting. And if you don't immediately see the effect of it, you may have actually problems as well. So. That, that one of the applications, of course, it's hard to put the time card into the uh, VR headset uh, <laughs> yet, but it's a first step. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, oh, w w one of the issues mainly is if you're restricted to that sort of 90 frames per second rate on your refresh, it will only probe your controllers every 90 times a second. So you're lit. 
you're limited in how that, that, that that's always a topic for leading edge um frame rate gaming especially and what I want to say, advanced players already feel it. They buy uh, yep. 240 hertz uh, screens. Uh, yeah. You can it's get 360 a... hertz now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to take a break and uh, do actual gaming. <laughs> no, once you hit a certain age, you don't have time for that. <laughs> All right, then I'll stay out. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I I find this stuff really, really interesting because it's it's not something that we normally typically think about. I mean, especially from the end user perspective, we all know that timing is important, but needing something like this to make timing this important, this is insane. And uh, you know, thanks for sending me one. This is great. 